radio TV phono nut and what we have here is an early 90s early to mid 90s Sanyo 19 inch black plastic crap TV now normally this is something that if I found it on the side of the road I would leave it where I found it and I used to work on a lot of sets like this back when sets like this were actually worth uh, repairing but when it got to the point I couldn't even get 10 bucks for a TV like this is whenever I stopped fooling with them but this one belongs to an older guy that I know and he really doesn't want a flat screen can't really fault him for that uh, I think I might have worked on this one years ago for a vertical deflection problem and he says it now has a no power condition so we're going to try to fix it for him if we can I just hope the flyback's not bad. I mean, they didn't fail that often on these, but it did happen from time to time. So let's see if we get any activity. Nope, completely and totally dead. All right, looks like November 1992. So for all intents and purposes, this set's 30 years old. And it's hard to believe, it's hard to imagine a set like this being almost 30 years old because I remember working on these when they were everywhere and four or five years old. But as far as TV repair, I'm about to the point where I'm not going to work on any television unless it's something of mine or on the rare occasion it's somebody I know it needs some help with one, but even picking up flat screen TVs to fix and resell is not even worth it anymore. When you can buy a 32 inch one at Walmart for oh, less than $200 on a good day, who's going to pay you anything to, to, to fix an old one or pay you a decent price for a used one? It's just not going to happen. As far as most TVs, they're just disposable and that's the way it is, but if this one doesn't have too much wrong with it, I'll try to get it going for the guy. Now, as far as a dead set condition, that could be any one of several things, but when we press the power button, I don't even hear any relay click. So that tells us right off the bat that either the, the 5 volt standby for the microprocessor circuitry is missing, or possibly the microprocessor itself is bad and loading down the 5 volts. I've seen that happen in these. It could be a bad uh, relay driver transistor. And it could be like what I said earlier, the something shorted and blew the main fuse and you know, we're not getting any power at all to the set. A common scenario with these types of TVs is for the flyback transformer to fail which in turn blows the horizontal output transistor which in turn will usually short the uh, regulator IC and the power supply and blow the fuse and a couple of fusible resistors in the process. I can't tell you how many of these types of sets, not just Sanyo's, but the same basic type of TV that I fixed back in the 90's where the repair consisted of a, of a new flyback transformer, a new horizontal output transistor, a regulator IC, uh, a f couple of fuses, and a fusible resistor. But the thing is, nowadays, since not many people are having these types of sets fixed anymore, it's really hard to find replacement parts, especially things like flyback transformers and that sort of thing, and if I find that that's what's wrong with this set, then I'm going to recommend that he just condemn it and find him something else. Alright, here we are with the back cover removed, and as Shango would say, welcome to flavor country. Now obviously this is not my workbench, because my workbench is in shambles right now but we're going to pull the circuit board and do a few basic checks with the multimeter and see if we can zero in the area that's uh, causing us the problem here. Okay, first let's see if the main fuse is good. And it is, so that's a good sign. 
Okay, now I'm going to check the horizontal output transistor. We're clipped to the collector, and I'm going to check from the collector to the base, and then the collector to emitter, and see what we've got. Okay, that's good. No short there, and no short there. So that's a good sign. Okay, this 3.3 ohm fusible resistor is okay. And then we have these two resistors that have gotten so hot that the values are not even on, on them anymore. One measures about 330 ohms and one measures about 470. And I believe those are the dropper resistors for the standby power supply. Those are active as long as the set's plugged in. And I think that's probably the next area where we need to look. So we know that our fuse and fusible resistor for the main power supply is good. Our horizontal output transistor is not shorted. So I think the next thing we need to do is apply power to the set and probe around for voltages in the standby supply circuit. We ought to have roughly 5 volts to control the microprocessor and then probably, oh, probably around 9 to 12 volts to energize the relay coil here. And if those voltages are missing, then we need to find out why. Well, it's starting to look like this power switch might be bad. If I can do this with one hand, that would be interesting. Yeah, I'm not getting any... I'm not getting any beep at all here, so this might actually be a simple fix. I can tell you these tack switches are pretty failure prone. After years of use, they just will either wear out and not make contact, or they'll develop internal leakage, and when you press the button, for example, you press the channel up button, and the volume may go down, or it'll... And I've seen some cases where the TV would just turn on by itself, or change channels by itself, etc. And I ran into some where shops would condemn such sets, blame it on a faulty microprocessor, when in fact it was just a bad tack switch. Now generally speaking, the microprocessors in these sets are, are reliable. Usually what takes them out is a lightning strike, but other than that they usually hold up pretty good. And they generally either work or they don't work. Now, yes, there are some exceptions to those to that rule, but most of the time when a microprocessor fails in one of these, it's going to be a hard failure and you're not going to get anything. Okay, I just hit it with the, with the uh, contact cleaner. Come on. Oh, so now it's not going to work, I guess. Mm, lady across the street's taking the Lord's name in vain. That's not good. All right, just for a test, I slid the circuit board back in the cabinet because I really don't need it to be anything touching this metal table while I'm working on it. That might not end well for the TV or me, so let's fire it up and see if it powers up now. I sprayed contact cleaner and all of the switches, and they were all kind of dead, so... Let's see if it'll work. If I can dig up a universal remote, I'll probably just program that to this TV and just send it home with him. Alright, here we go. Is it going to power up or not? Nope, I guess not. So I guess we have some more checking that needs to be uh, done. Well, dadgummit, I was hoping for an easy fix, but still, you should always check your basics first. I can't tell you how many times I've seen guys, guys, and I've been guilty of it myself, would uh, take a TV or a piece of equipment and just dive right into it without checking the basics, and then I wind up chasing my tail because I can't find what's wrong with it and then I go back and check the basics and find something that I should have caught two minutes after I pulled the back off of it. So, always check your basics. Now, I just felt these resistors back here that are in the standby circuit and they're both rather warm so something is drawing current through them. 
So I think the next step is to put something non-conductive on this table and pull the board out and flip it over where I can check some voltages. But I am relieved to know that the problem does not appear to be in the uh, horizontal output stage or the uh, main power supply. So that's a relief. It is something in the standby power supply and about the only thing I can think of that it could be that would condemn this TV at this point would be if the microprocessor is indeed shorted and I don't know if a power surge or lightning hit this set and he didn't indicate one way or another about that then that could very well be the trouble. Okay, what you just heard is one of these Emerson Swingmate record players. I believe this particular one is from 1979. It's one that I basically patched up because I do not want to spend any money on it. Uh, just to give you a little backstory on these types of record players, the Swingmate and the Wildcat was originally introduced by General Electric in about 1966 or so. And GE continued to make those in some form or another, as well as uh, some various kitty phonographs up until 1975, at which time GE sold the, uh, their record player line to a company called Interstate Industries, who continued to build the Wildcat stereo models and the Swingmate mono models, as well as the kitty phonographs under the Concert Hall and the Emerson brand as well as several store brands. I know True Tone, Western Auto, and Sears had them. Uh, they continued to make these up until the probably the early 1980s. Like I said, this one I believe is a 79 model. When I found this, the cartridge was missing out of it and the center spindle was damaged. The little pin that holds it in place was broken and the result was the spindle was going all the way down to the bottom. It would not lock into place. So I looked on the VM website and he has the spindles I think for 15 bucks plus shipping which of course 15 bucks is a fair price but I just don't want to put any money into this because I don't have any attachment to it and it's getting ever harder to sell stuff like this at least locally and i'm not doing ebay anymore so that's out of the question so anyway i dug around and found a manual stubby spindle and a 45 adapter and i dug in my junk box and found an old bsr x5h crystal cartridge it's still good and those things are getting pricey too so this thing's going on the Facebook baby clothes and cell phone pages just like it is for oh, about 20 bucks. And if it does, doesn't sell in a reasonable length of time, I'm pulling the cartridge out of it and throwing the rest in the trash. I mean, yes, I could fix this 
as you can tell by the little demonstration it does need a clean and lube job of the uh, automatic mechanism but quite frankly I'm tired of spending my time and money on this thing on this crap just enlist it for sale for a fair price considering what was spent on it and the labor involved and all you get is a bunch of damn looky-loos and people sending you the automated message is this still available and then when you click on their profile it's obviously a blank page it's probably means it's a scammer so I'm just fed up with it in fact I recently just threw away about 40 or 50 record players and other things a lot of it I didn't want to throw away I won't get into the drama involving the reason they got thrown away but just suffice it to say I felt pressured into doing it and I don't like getting rid of stuff because I feel pressured into doing it if I get rid of something I want it to be on my terms not on somebody else's terms but anyway enough about the record player let's pull the TV out and get back on it it's been about three weeks since I looked at it last because there's been so much other stuff going on just hadn't had time to fool with it uh, the guy that owns the TV called me and told me that before it died it developed an intermittent condition where the picture would draw in on the sides and, gee thanks for telling me that another problem I gotta solve he also told me he found uh, an old black and white console TV in his grandmother's house, but he didn't know how he was going to get it out of there. Apparently the house hasn't been lived in in ages. It's in bad shape. And I told him I'd like to have it, but don't put yourself in any danger getting it out. Now this guy's probably 70 years old, if not, or he's close to it. So if this TV belonged to his grandmother, then there's no telling how old it is. So let's get the let's get the Sanyo back up here and see if we can figure out what's wrong with it. He's already told me not to spend much money on it, which I'm not gonna do. It's not worth spending much money on. He could go to the thrift store and probably pick him up one for ten bucks. Okay, during the last installment, I think we determined that we had a standby power supply problem. So we have our cardboard to act as insulation so I can work on this circuit board out here on this metal table. And let's try to find out what's causing our problem. Okay, so we have AC coming in these resistors here that provide power to the standby circuit. And we have 124 coming in and we go through this resistor and down through this other resistor and coming out of the other resistor we have 75 72 volts so obviously they're rectifying the ac once they drop it through those resistors and rectifying it and regulating it and then using it to provide standby voltage okay i'm getting about nine volts on my relay coil I think it should probably be about 12 and on most of the pins on the microprocessor I'm getting between a little less than 3 and 3.7 volts and there should be 5 volts there so it's starting to not look good it's starting to look like maybe this microprocessor is shorted and loading down the power supply I've seen that before and if that's the case it's not worth repairing well, that's weird. When I hit the power button off camera, the relay chattered and tried to engage. But now it won't do anything, and I'm not getting any, any signal at the base of the relay driver transistor, which I should get when I press the power button. And we're not getting anything. Okay, before we go any further, we're going to try this just for grins and giggles. We're going to jump out the relay contacts. And if the rest of the chassis is okay, the high voltage should come up. And if the high voltage doesn't come up, then that indicates we've got more problems. And that's going to lead me more to believe that maybe a power surge or lightning hit this. I mean, if I had a schematic in front of me on this, I'd probably 
trace it out more, but with no schematic and knowing this is basically a piece of junk TV and knowing the guy could probably ask some of his friends and they probably got an old CRT television in the closet or the garage they'd give him. This one's just not worth spending a whole lot of time or effort on in my opinion. Okay, we have our jumper in place and it's still dead. Okay, we have the contacts on the relay jumpered. We have the TV plugged in and I'm checking for some high voltage here. And I'm, I don't mean at the picture tube, I mean is in B plus. And looking at the positive terminal on our filter cap, we have nothing. Okay, we have AC coming into the fuse, but nothing coming out, which tells us our fuse either blew or is not making a good connection. And yep, that fuse blew whenever I jumpered the contact, so yeah, something shorted here. Probably either the rectifiers, the regulator, or the horizontal output transistor. Alright, we have a standard bridge rectifier network consisting of four diodes, and this one is shorted. Now, I've learned in the past, when you deal with a, a situation like this where one diode is shorted, you better just replace all four of them, because I've replaced the one or two in the bridge that were shorted, and then as soon as voltage hit them, the other two would short. So, and I'm starting to think more and more that this was a lightning job because we checked this fuse before and it was good. And then whenever I jumped the relay to energize the main power supply, this diode shorted and blew the fuse. So I think what happened, lightning hit this set, probably weakened the diode but didn't short it and also messed up something in the standby supply, possibly this microprocessor. And then whenever I jumped the the relay contacts then this diode shorted from being weakened by the power surge or lightning hit and blew the fuse all right there's our four old diodes and the blown fuse a four amp 125 volt and like i said only one check shorted but i've learned from experience when one shorted you better change all four of them which we've done as you can see here now I need to go round up a fuse and, and we'll try it again. Okay, we now have high voltage and a raster, so that's a good sign. Let's see if the relay will click when I push the button now. Remember, we still have the contacts jumpered. Okay, the relay is just chattering, which leads me to believe it's not getting enough voltage and not staying in. Okay, we're plugged back in, jumper removed from the relay contacts, now let's see what happens. Nothing. See, I think what's happening is relay coil is just not getting enough juice. What I'm looking for is some kind of voltage regulator, whether it be an IC or a Zener diode or what have you. This is one of those times when I wished I hadn't, hadn't have, uh, gotten rid of all of my later Sam's photo facts. You know, when I thought I was done with these types of TVs, I got rid of all of my Sam's thinking I'd never need them again. And, well, every once in a while, one comes along like this that I do need one. If I could see the service manual on this, I'm sure I could go right to the problem. Okay, I think we may have found the problem, something I've never seen in all of my years of working on televisions. The remote control sensor, I believe, is shorted. Whenever I desoldered it, our voltage going to the relay jumped up to, and the survey says, 13.8 volts. And our 5 volt line jumped up to, right at 5 volts. Look at there. Now when I press the power button, boom, how about that? And I soldered the remote control sensor back in, and we're back to 9 volts on the relay, and 3.8 on the 5 volt line. So yeah, we need to find a remote control sensor. Okay, here's the remote sensor, and from left to right, our pin configuration is ground, data, and our voltage input, our 5 volts. 
And from our voltage input to ground, it reads 160 ohms both directions. So I'd say that's that's low, that's leaky. Now, I'm going to have to try to find one of these somewhere. At one time, I would have had some of these, but when I got rid of all of the photo facts, I got rid of most of all the old TV boards, too. So, I'm going to have to try to locate one of these, and if I can't, he's just going to have to use it without a remote. I suspect he uses the remote on his converter box anyway. You should just turn the TV on at the set, and then use the remote for your box to change the channel. Okay, I found this board in my junk. It's, uh, I think it's an old Samsung board, but I'm going to try to see if we can make this remote sensor work on this board. If we don't, we're out of luck because this is the only, only TV board I know of that I have left. Okay, I took the sensor out of the enclosure, the one off of the Samsung board, and this has got a little surface-mounted IC on it. That the Sanyo doesn't have, or excuse me, the Sanyo does have a little surface mounted IC on it that I didn't see until I got it out of the uh, enclosure. So let me check and try to determine what shorted the the eye itself or the integrated circuit. Well, now we got another problem. Now I turn it on, the relay pulls in, no high voltage comes up, and then it clicks off. Like it's going into some kind of overcurrent shutdown. I'm about ready to tell him just to get a new TV and forget about this thing. There's just some things it's not worth fooling with. And when it's one problem after another, then it's not worth fooling with. Especially on something like this. And I think what the problem is, we're not getting any horizontal drive. Because whenever I check the B+, plus, it jumps up to like 162 volts for the couple of seconds that the relay is engaged and these types of power supplies in these things will not regulate if the proper load is not placed on them and when you're not getting any horizontal drive for whatever reason then the proper load is not going to be placed because the horizontal output stage won't run so I'm going to look into this a little bit more but not much more okay we have this resistor here that drops the B plus down to a lower value for the horizontal driver stage. I only have 1.5 volts on this end that feeds the driver stage and back on the B plus end we have 150 volts. Either something is shorted and draining it down or we have an open resistor. And let's do an ohm meter check from that point to ground on the other end of this resistor. Alright, where are you? Where are you? Right here? Let's see. Four point some odd mega ohms, so I don't think we have a short there. Okay, this resistor is reading 8.1K out of circuit. And let's see what the bands are on this. Okay, that does appear to be gray, red, red, so that would be 8.2K. And it's reading 8.1K, so that's with intolerance. So apparently something is hogging down the voltage on the other side of it. Okay, the transistor, the horizontal drive transistor checks okay. I think we have a loss of drive from the jungle IC to the transistor. I don't have my scope up here handy. But I did set my meter to AC to see if I got any kind of indication on the uh, base of the horizontal driver transistor when the set was powered on. And I'm getting absolutely nothing. So I think there's no drive coming out of the jungle IC. And I hate to call it a day on this, but I think it's time to, I think it's time to throw in the towel on this one. I do believe lightning a power surge hit this based on the fact that when we got this set I checked the fuses, the fuse and the diodes, the horizontal output transistor, the regulator, etc. Couldn't find any shorts. It's just the relay wouldn't energize. And then whenever I jumped out the contacts on the relay something shorted and the fuse blew. 
and then I found that one of the rectifier diodes was shorted which led me to believe that a power surge ran on the, in on this thing and might not have totally destroyed that diode but it might have weakened it to the point that when voltage hit it the next time it's going to short and I think that's what happened here and so we replaced the diodes and then when we jumped the relay contacts the high voltage came up and we had snow on the screen of course I have no idea if the tuner and tuner control circuitry was working or not which that wouldn't work anyway with the microprocessor not working right which it wasn't at the time because our 5 volt standby was down to under 4 volts and our 12 volts for the relay was down to about 9 volts and we determined that that was caused by a shorted remote control receiver when I pulled the receiver out of the board pushed the power button it fired up great and then I was going to put the uh, receiver out of the Samsung board in here and I pushed the button and it's doing what you're seeing it doing right now we're not getting any we're not getting any horizontal drive and that's causing the microprocessor to shut the TV down if it doesn't sense the presence of drive then it will not allow the relay to stay in more than a couple of seconds so you know if this was some classic vintage TV I might could see going at it more but this is not a classic vintage TV this is the kind of TV that if Shango had it and he could get a picture on it it would become an EOL specimen and I don't fault him for that one bit these TVs are virtually worthless and yes I keep hearing about retro gaming retro gaming retro gaming well for one thing the retro gamers are few and far between that's still a very small niche market in the sense they're paying big bucks for the high-end Sony Trinitrons and Sony broadcast monitors and JVC D series TVs that sort of thing and even at that there's still enough of those in existence to go around without having to pay big bucks for one but I won't get on my soapbox about that but I think I'm gonna probably just throw in the towel on this because I suspect because generally the drive comes right out of the jungle I see into the base of the horizontal driver transistor and then that signal is amplified there slightly and then coupled to the horizontal output transistor via the driver transformer and I've learned in the past when you get a set that when you fix one part one problem and then another part fails before your very eyes and then you fix that part or that problem and then something else fails before your very eyes you're just asking for trouble I mean yeah I could track down a jungle IC and put in here and who's to say that the tuner wouldn't be bad or something else wouldn't go wrong you know, he's got a good run out of this set and I think he just needs to retire it and on that note the battery is about to die so that's it okay it's a new day and I decided to look into this one more time this set is a model 19 uh, excuse me, DS19230. There is no Sam's photo fact on this, which I'm surprised by because these TVs were common as dirt. Uh, usually what I did back in the day when I ran into a situation like that, I'd just find a Sam's photo fact that was close and go with that because usually these chassis were used in maybe several different models and I could sometimes find a model that was close enough it would get me by the only other service manual I found was a free download that's so blurry that I really can't get any use out of it another site wants about 18 bucks for a download which may not be any better than the free one and quite frankly this TV really isn't worth 18 bucks back in the day I wouldn't have batted an eye at $18 for a service manual because the TV was actually worth repairing but 
but basically what I want to check is to see if we're getting any voltage to the uh, jungle IC. I did find a data sheet for that and there is actually an NTE cross reference to that chip. I ma mainly want to see if we're getting any voltage to that IC because if we're not then obviously the chip's not going to work and if we are getting it then that's going to more confirm that that chip is likely bad. So we need to take this back up here and repopulate the good parts back in it. I'm probably not going to take them out this time. I mean diodes are about the cheapest thing you can get and I've got a bunch of them. So, so let's repopulate the parts in this chassis and see if we can possibly get this to work. Okay, the parts have been repopulated. Let's turn it on and see what happens now. Well, ain't that something? Now the high voltage came up. Hmm, so that's interesting. What do we have on the screen? We have a raster. Alright, let's tap around on this board and see if it shuts down. Okay, I resoldered the jungle I see and a couple other things. Didn't nothing nothing stood out to me as having a bad solder connection, but you know sometimes they can look good and still have a hairline crack that would cause an intermittent problem. So the best thing to do is resolder everything. Alright, let's see what we got now. Okay, the high voltage came up. I want to check some voltages and see where things are. Okay, bear with me just a minute here. 60 volts on the going to the horizontal driver stage. 0.3 on the base. Let's switch it to AC and see what we have. Yeah, really not getting anything there. You, I really need a scope to check that, but I just wanted to look at the comparative between what was broken and what's working now. Okay, the chassis is back in the cabinet and the plane flying over to make sure I'm doing it right. And we're going to turn it on one more time and see what happens and then kind of beat and bang around on the chassis and see if we lose horizontal drive. Alright, here we go. If I push the right button, and now we've lost horizontal drive again, damn it. And you know what? These are the kind of sets I hate. These intermittent problems that you think you got them fixed, and you turn them on, and click, click. And I see this connection here doesn't look too good. That's coming off of the regulator, I see. That could be part of the kickstart circuit. You know, these newer TVs, I say newer from about 1980 on, they get their voltages for the most part off of the second area of the flyback. But in order for that to happen, the horizontal sweep has to work. So generally in these sets, there's some type of kickstart circuit. So when you first press the power button, a voltage very briefly appears to kickstart the horizontal oscillator circuit. And once the horizontal starts, and it can just pick up on its own and there's no need for the primary startup circuit. So let me resolder this and see if that takes care of the problem. Okay, once again, let's see what happens. Still nothing. I'm about ready just to call him and tell him to forget it. And no amount, no amount of beating or flexing the board is having any effect on this. Hello? for AT&T and DirecTV customers. 
We have a promotion running in which we are helping our customers dropping down their monthly bills. Press 1 and be directed to a live representative. Thank you for showing me to CDMT. This is Mike. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing marvelous. How are you? Alright, so sounds good. I'm fine. Thanks for asking this call. It's going to call you waiting into services. Everything breaking fine over there? Oh, yes, sir. My rabbit ears are working wonderful. I beg your pardon, sir? I said my rabbit ears are working wonderful. Alright, then are you happy with your monthly bill? Or is it too high for you? Oh, no. My monthly bill is zero. I get free TV. Hello? Hmm. Hmm, I guess they're going to do something about that now. And no, I don't have direct TV, dish network, cable, or any other paid subscription for TV. If I can't get it out of the air for free, or watch it on a DVD or a tape, then I'm probably not interested in watching it. Alright, one more time, let's see what happens, and I bet we know what's going to happen before I even push the button. Yeah, see there? Not a darn thing. Okay, pin 25 is the horizontal VCC pin for the jungle IC. And I can't do this on the camera because I'm going to need both hands to do this. I'm going to have my meter probe placed on that pin. And we're going to turn the TV on and see if we have any voltage on that pin. Okay, it goes up to 2.5 volts and shuts down. And I think it should be more than that. I'm thinking probably between 9 and 12 volts there on that pin. Well, now it just came back on. Alright, it's on, and I'm just going to let it stay on for a while and see if it shuts off. And I'm going to flex and push on the board and see if that makes it go off. Yep, it went off and came back on, so apparently there is a bad connection somewhere. Okay, I took that remote receiver completely out because even though I had the pins unsoldered, me flexing on the board might have been causing it to short out there because I'm sure there was a little microscopic solder on that. Now, that shouldn't have caused the horizontal drive problem, but we're going to beat and flex on this board and see if we can make it stop. Nothing I'm doing is making this thing turn off now. Didn't think it was anything to do with the CRT board, but I had to tap on it anyway. Well, I just don't know. Okay, once again, we have the board back in the cabinet. And we're just going to let it play. I'm not confident that this thing is fixed. I think there's something that's still highly intermittent here. 
I just don't know what it is. And I know it's nothing to do with this old remote sensor because even whenever I had it out completely off the board yesterday, it still uh, was acting screwy. And yeah, this remote sensor is to blame for hogging down the 5 volt and 12 volt standby supplies, but I don't think this is the cause of our intermittent lack of horizontal drive, and I did check the VCC on that chip with it working, and we got about 3.3 volts, so maybe that is correct. And now we're back to where we were again, clicky clicky and no high voltage. Okay, even though the original horizontal driver transistor tested okay with the meter, I went ahead and replaced it anyway with a beefier part off of that Samsung board because there's often more to a transistor test than just the uh, testing it with a meter. So we're going to plug it up, hit the power button. It'll probably it'll probably uh, lull me into a false sense of security and turn on properly and make me think it's fixed and then it'll screw up again. All right, let's see what happens. Just as I suspected, the same shit. Okay, I traced pin 22, which is the drive output from the chip, over to the base of the horizontal driver transistor. And the only thing between those two points is a 330 ohm resistor, and it checks good. And there's a disk capacitor that connects between pin 22 and ground. So, doesn't appear to be anything wrong there. So I'm looking at probably, I've never seen an intermittent IC before, but I suppose it's possible either that or this crystal here is intermittent. And I don't see one of those on my donor board, and I'm not going to, probably not going to spend much more time or effort on this. He just needs to write it off and go to the thrift store and pick him up a, another set for 10 bucks. All right, it's back together. I tried to call the guy, no answer. Hopefully he'll call me back later and hopefully I can come get him to remove this thing from my presence. But yeah, I'm just not, I'm just not gonna deal with this anymore. Like I've said about a dozen times now, the thrift store would probably be more than happy to sell him something like this for five or 10 bucks. There's no sense in me wasting hours and hours and hours on some piece of crap like this. And like I said, this is not a classic piece of electronic equipment. It's a, quite frankly, pardon my French, a, a shitty 1990s television that, as far as I'm concerned, isn't worth two cents. And see, it's still not powering up. And like I said, it could be the jungle I see, it could be the, the reference crystal, but I'm just, I'm just not going to keep throwing parts at this thing. If I had a print for it, then that might be different, but I'm not paying 18 bucks for a blurry downloaded service manual. Like I said, the TV's not even worth $18. See, it's just not coming on, no matter what I do. But who knows, you plug it in tomorrow, it might fire right up, but I'm just tired of fooling with it. Dead gum airplanes, I got about as many of them here as Shango does, but yeah, and I'm probably not gonna take in any more crap like this. If, somebody, if somebody's dead set, hell-bent determined that they've got to have a TV like this, then there's plenty of them around that you can get for a lot less money than what it's going to cost you to get the piece of crap you already have fixed. So I uh, just throw it away and get you something else. I mean, even my own Zenith TV from 1984, if it goes out, and if I can fix it easily and without a lot of money, then I'll fix it. But if it's going to be an involved process like this one's turning into, then it can go bye-bye too. I'm, not, I'm just not devoting the time or, or money into it. Okay, here's what I can see of the schematic on that set. Yes, I'm back in it again. 
pin 20 is a VCC pin. I think that must be the startup voltage. Eight volts there. And then it gets its voltage through a couple of resistors in series that terminate back to the 130 volt source or 135 volt source. And you have this C401 22 microfarad filter cap there. And that also comes up to these two capacitors. And then that goes back to pin 25, which is 6 volts. So let me write these numbers down since I can't print this. Well, I unsoldered the pins on that chip that have to do with the horizontal and a few others in the process. And then that voltage that goes to pin 20 jumps up to 48 volts. So what does that tell you? It tells us this chip is loading things down. Still not 100% sure it's bad, but it's looking more and more like it is, like it has an intermittent fault. As in, on a rare occasion, it'll actually work, but most of the time it won't. And if that is indeed the case, that's the first time I've ever seen that with an IC like this. Either they work or they don't work. There's no intermittent. But I guess there's a first time for everything. And now I just turned it on and the high voltage came up. So while that's up, let's make some voltage measurements and see what happens. Alright, that's up to 5 volts there. It should be 8. And that makes me wonder, whenever I resolder those pins, the heat from my soldering iron might have uh, coached this chip into working. While it's on, let me go fetch a cable, a converter box, and an antenna, and we can at least see if the tuner is going to work on this. So it's running through this stupid auto program crap, but whenever it ran past three, I didn't see anything discernible on the screen. So if this thing's got tuner issues, then I know we're not going any further with it. Let me just cut this off and wait till it gets back around to three. Is this one of those that goes to 120 on cable? Yes, dead gummit, I guess so. Oh, so now it's going to go back around and stop. Try to find the channel button on here. Try to get this thing back around to three. Come on, go to three, damn it. <laughs> yeah, there it is on three, and as you can see, it's just it's like the AFT's not locking on, so yeah, this thing's jacked. In my opinion, it's just really not worth spending any more money on. Now, if it had a good picture on here, then I might take a chance and order an IC for it. But I just, I just think this set's jacked up. I think lightning hit it. Sets don't have these many problems unless they have help from the outside. And this one, I think, had some help from the outside. So this time I'm done. We're not revisiting this again. I'm going to call him, and I hope he comes and gets it out of my way, because I certainly don't want it. And it could very well be the jungle I see causing the tuner not to lock in, because I think all that's in the same chip. But without a decent service manual on this, there's just really no sense in going further. And even with a decent service manual, there's no sense in going further, because like I've said about ten times already, there's loads of sets from this era out there with a lot less problems than what this one has. And there's just no sense in wasting one's time and money on this thing. I mean, it's obvious something hit it. And I just need to recommend that he throw it away and find something else.